Well, didn't I kick up a hornet's nest last week in my video about driving EVs around the world? There was a lot of opinionated comments on there, but the one that really stuck out to me was someone saying, yeah, but is that even overlanding? I thought, wow, going around the world in a vehicle sounds like overlanding to me. The West Africa route may be the most epic on the planet, but then what actually is overlanding? I feel like tons of people have tried to define it over the years, and every time I read those definitions, they don't really sit well with me. So in today's episode, I'm gonna run through some real world examples, and I'm gonna analyze other people's definition of overlanding, and try to see if it actually fits with reality, what I think, and I'm interested to hear what you think as well. So grab something cool to drink, grab a comfortable seat, let's get into it. What is overlanding? I think it would be hard to have a discussion about overlanding without kind of acknowledging where it came from and how it differs in North America to the rest of the world. And I do feel pretty strongly that in the rest of the world, in Australia, South Africa, Europe, overlanding has always been first and foremost about travel. It's about going somewhere new. It's about going far away from home and having new experiences and exploring. That's, I think, where it started from. Not to say that that's all that it is or that you know that's the one definition. That was kind of the early beginnings of it. People who loved to go traveling decided to do it in a vehicle. I think differently in North America, overlanding has kind of evolved from the four-wheel driving or the off-road scene. So people have been four-wheel driving in North America since forever. There's a huge big like off-road motorsport component. You know, there's King of the Hammers, there's the Baja 1000, there's all those off-road races. And I think overlanding kind of grew out of that in North America. So overlanding here traditionally has had a very big off-roading component. And a lot of people, I think, get quite confused. Where is the line or where do you blur? Is it off-roading or is it overlanding? And I think then you wind up with a lot of people gatekeeping and a lot of people saying things like, yeah, they didn't even go off pavement. That's not overlanding. Or they don't have a winch. They don't have lockers. You know, they don't have low range four wheel drive, that's not overlanding or, or that's overlanding light or that's wimpy overlanding or, or any of those kinds of things. And so what I like to do in these examples is look at a real use case from the actual world. And so way back in the day when I drove the Pan American Highway, a couple, Brad and Sheena Van Orden, they set out to drive the Pan American Highway just like me. They had a 1984 VW van and they drove from Alaska all the way to Argentina, 17 countries, a big year of adventure. It was massive, they had a great time. At the end, they shipped it to Malaysia and they drove from Malaysia all the way to India. Then they shipped it kind of into Central Asia. They drove all around Central Asia and Nepal and all these places down into Morocco, tons of Europe, and then came back to North America. So they were on the road for like three years. They wrote a couple of books about it. If you're interested, I'll put the links down in the description. They're incredible books. All of that, I think everyone would have to say is overlanding. That is a massive dream overland trip, I think, for virtually everyone who's into overlanding. So if that counts as overlanding, let's just run through it. They didn't have four wheel drive. They didn't have diff locks. They didn't have low range. They didn't have big tires. They didn't have a winch. So they didn't have any of those things but what they were doing was definitely overlanding. So when I use that real world example, I personally feel like it's safe to say, none of those things are what defines overlanding. You don't have to be four wheel driving to be overlanding. You could be, but it isn't a requirement. The next thing that I often seen thrown around is the requirement to cross international borders for your trip to be considered overlanding. And I know this is really popular definition and the guys over at Expedition Overland, they have a huge big blog post where that is basically their de defining criteria, where they say it's not overlanding until you cross international borders, until you experience new cultures and all kind of the challenges that go with like getting visas and dealing with border crossings and all of that. And again, I like to think of a real world example to kind of test that and see if it actually holds up and is actually true. And it's interesting because in their blog post, they actually reference Alfred Canning, who built the Canning stock route in Australia. And they talk about that is the origin of the word overlanding, where they were moving cattle vast distances across Australia through the outback. 
And so it's interesting that they use Alfred Canning and the Canning stock route as like the origin of overlanding because that's a trail that's in Australia by an Australian guy, you know, not leaving Australia. So the Australians didn't cross any international borders, but they invented overlanding. Hmm, that's interesting. And then when I think about it, you know, I spent a year and a half in Australia driving all over the place, across the Simpson Desert, the Canning, Fraser Island, the old Telly Track. Some of these are like the most famous overlanding routes in the entire world. A lot of the Australians I bumped into doing it as well, they've never even left Australia in their entire lives. So are you gonna tell me that the people doing that in Australia are not overlanders? I think that clearly counts as overlanding, driving the Canning stock route. And the whole idea that you, know, you have to experience different cultures than your own, it's kind of a funny thing to say because when you drive the Canning stock route like I did, you don't see a single person for 10 days. You're in absolutely the middle of nowhere and nothing. In a sense, there is no culture. There are no people to talk to. There is no like street market to buy food from. There just is nothing. That's what the trip is. Same story, you know, if you were to drive across the Sahara Desert, the whole point is there's nobody out there. So I think it's kind of a funny thing to say that you would have to cross an international border. And I also find it a little bit limiting or a little bit strange because I can think of, you know, the example, someone who grew up in Toronto, they've spent their whole life in that part of Canada. They gear up, they plan, they spend a summer driving up to Tukti Arctic on the Arctic Circle. They drive the Dempster Highway, explore all of that and go back to Toronto. They didn't cross any international borders. They didn't even take their passport with them. But let me tell you, that is an incredible adventure. One of the most incredible overlanding treks I think you can do. And one of the most beautiful scenic places in the whole world. Same story, if someone grew up on the east coast of, a, of America, they're in Boston, they're in Florida, whatever, they cruise out, they explore Moab, they explore Utah and Arizona and all of kind of the western remote states and drive some of the famous trails and the canyons and, and then they drive all the way home again. I think that is definitely overlanding. So to say that you have to cross an international border, I find that really strange and it doesn't really jive with me. Again, you could cross international borders, it could be part of your trip, but I don't think it's actually necessary to call the thing overlanding. As I scan down Expedition Overland's blog post, the next thing that they really focus on is that the trip has to be self-reliant, and then that makes it overlanding. And again, I kind of check that with the reality, and I think back to my expeditions and where I've gone around the world, and let's just run through how self-reliant I was. So when I drove the Pan American Highway or when I drove all the way around Africa, the simple reality was I was stopping to buy gas once every three to 10 days, depending on exactly where I was. That's a pretty normal looking gas station. You're using money. There's an attendant, there's a pump. There's even a store where often you could buy like chips and Coke. So I was relying on that infrastructure and those people. Without that, there was no trip. Same story goes, every few days I was buying food from street markets. I was buying fruit, vegetables, beans, rice, you know, all the basics so that I had food. Again, without being able to buy that stuff, there was no trip, I couldn't do it. As well as that, especially for West Africa, I had to get a visa for essentially every single country. So once a month, I was in a capital city, I was at an embassy and I was saying, please, sir, can I have a visa? You know, filling out a huge big form. I was using photocopiers. I was getting passport photos taken. I was even firing emails back and forward. Again, I'm relying on all those embassy staff and all that infrastructure to help me to get a visa so that I can even go into the next country. Of course, then to get there, I have to talk to border guards. I have to rely on immigration and customs being open, possibly even internet to, you know, for them to be able to send things back and forward. All of that, again, I'm relying on the people who are in the country. Same story goes too, when things go wrong, I was often a solo vehicle, solo person. When I rolled the Jeep in Uganda, I relied on locals to help get me out of that. When I got stuck in Kenya, some locals helped. Oftentimes, I was relying on people around me, even for simple things like directions. Oh yeah, don't go that way. Make sure you go this way, otherwise, you know, the bridge is out. Absolutely, I was relying on other people. And you can't plan ahead for that. You can't have a GPS map that knows the bridge was washed out last week. We're talking about remote Africa here. So when I think back and I read, you have to be self-reliant, I'm like, 
that doesn't check out at all. In a sense, I was like the opposite of self-reliant. I actually think overlanding in a big part is about putting yourself into the environment and relying on and trusting the other people that are around you and being willing to ask them for help and help them when they're stuck like I did in the Congo, but then also they'll help you and they'll provide the services that you need. And even just knowing that you're going to be able to buy fuel. Because after all, it doesn't matter how good your vehicle is. If you can't buy fuel, you're not going anywhere. So actually, although most people say you have to be self-reliant, I don't like that one at all. And, and I'm gonna say, I think that's total nonsense. The opposite is actually true. You need to be actually more open and more trusting and more willing to place, you know, your kind of success in the hands of other people and you need their help to complete the trip. I would not have been able to drive West Africa without the help of hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of happy, kind, friendly people. The next criteria as we go down the list is traveling remotely. And so if you're not traveling remotely, then a lot of people say you're not overlanding. And again, I find that an interesting one because I think it really depends how you define remote. And so here, you know, in the developed parts of North America, I could be out for hours and hours and hours on a terrible road way back in the mountains and I'll still get cell phone service and there's still other logging roads and probably even bump into other people in four wheel drives. So while that's about as remote as you can get, I don't know if that actually counts as all that remote versus when you're in West Africa, when you're in Bolivia, you could be on a paved road but you are literally thousands of miles away from anyone who speaks English, from any electricity, from any kind of major development like cell phones that really work well, all of that, even though you're on a paved road or a crumbling paved road. So I think remote is kind of a tricky one. And I guess, you know, in developed countries like the US or Canada, when people say remote, they usually mean like as far away from civilization as you can get. As soon as you go into another country, if you're in El Salvador, even when you're in a developed part of El Salvador, you're gonna feel like you're pretty far away from you know, your developed world that you're used to. So I think the necessity to go remote, I think it depends. I think that one, again, is not really a strict criteria. You don't have to be in the middle of nowhere to be overlanding. Maybe you are, but I don't think you have to be. And then the final criteria on the list is a discussion about time or kind of the length of your journey or your trip or you know your overland thing that you're doing. And this one is really tricky as well because you know kind of the the standard answer is you know it has to span like days, weeks, months, maybe even years. And I think you know yes if people are on the road for years that's kind of an easy way to say well yeah they're probably overlanding but even people who are just out for a long weekend I think that can still be overlanding for sure. You go out and you have a really big adventure. Maybe it's somewhere you've never been before. Maybe you're out in some new terrain, like you've never spent time exploring in the snow or you've never been to Death Valley because you, know, you grew up where there's lots of trees. If you drive from like a really treed green area and you're down in Death Valley for a long weekend, that is absolutely gonna feel like a different planet. And I think you are absolutely overlanding and you squeeze in these trips wherever you can, get the most out of it while you can, and then maybe you have to go home and you have to go back to work. So I would never wanna dismiss someone's trip because they can't just quit their job or you know they can't live in a car for years at a time. I think overlanding is still valid and is still an amazing thing to do, whether it's a weekender, whether it's a week, or whether it's a few months up to Alaska. Definitely, in my book, that's still overlanding. So after all of that, what actually is overlanding? How do you define this thing that has become so popular now in North America? And I do think that Scott Brady said it best. He's the editor of Overland Journal. He founded Expedition Portal. He defines overlanding as vehicle-based adventure travel. And I think that is just such a nice, simple, succinct way of saying it. And so at first we say vehicle-based. I think it makes sense to say that overlanding involves using a vehicle to get somewhere. If you're walking, I don't know that that's overlanding. Certainly people on bicycles, people in four-wheel drives, you know, all the way up to huge big trucks. I think all of that is definitely overlanding. So that's just a simple sort of qualifier to say, if you're in a vehicle, you know, now go and have an adventure, 
go on adventure travel. And I like how Scott says that it's adventure travel because the travel itself is the adventure. It is exciting, it is to probably a destination you've never been to, maybe a destination that's you know exotic or somehow interesting to you, whether it's a hot spring in the mountains, which is how I started overlanding, or it's a waterfall, or it's a great campsite, or it's just something that kind of gets you interested in like, hmm, I wanna head back here and I'm gonna go and explore and I'm just gonna enjoy as I go along. And if you see something beautiful along, along the way, you're gonna jump out, you're gonna explore it, take photos, just enjoy it however you like to. Adventure travel, I think is a great way to define overlanding. And all of that other stuff, the gear, the actual vehicle that you used, you know, how far are you going? How many stamps are in your passport? Those are all kind of like optional add-ons and accessories. You know, you don't have to have a downhill mountain bike and go off the biggest jump to be a mountain biker. You don't have to go heli skiing to be a skier. I don't think you have to go international and go for years at a time to be an overlander. So I'm gonna to try to keep that in mind. As I build the new vehicle, I'm gonna to go to Overland Expo and a bunch of other shows this year try not to get caught up in the hype, try not to get caught up in all the gear and just focus on the adventure. So with all of that said, my new vehicle is very close. Uh, it's all locked in, it's all happening, working really hard to get it to Overland Expo. But if you wanna get the behind the scenes scoop, dig into all the whys of the build, what exactly am I doing? That's all over on Patreon right now. So you can jump over there, you can see photos of progress, you can see the renderings, and we're having huge discussions there about all the different aspects of the build. So that's all over on Patreon. There's a link down in the description if you wanna jump over there and get all that early exclusive access. And so until next time, I hope you can get out and go overlanding, whatever that looks like for you. Make sure you have fun out there and maybe I'll bump into you on the road.